All right, let's go to work. We are in senior Eng AP English, uh, and we are working with Hamlet 2. I'm going to make observations that are germane, first of all, to Hamlet 2, 1, and then we'll kind of move on. My assumption is that you have the play in front of you, that you actually have opened your uh, hymnals to Hamlet 2, 1, because I'm going to be making references. Sometimes I'll reference line numbers, jot down those references, go back and look on your own. Don't try and necessarily, you know, find everything right now. I already said to you, that Hamlet is a play about spying. It's a play about the opening lines of the play, who's there, trying to understand and identify who is there and what is his or her primary motivations. That's central to this play. And so we have the introduction primarily of what we will call the surreptitious theme or the spy theme in Hamlet 2. Now, we already saw this introduced in Hamlet 1, where Hamlet says, I'm going to take on an antic disposition. That means I'm going to pretend like I'm crazy so that I can get close to the king and find out if, in fact, he really did murder my father. Hamlet 2.1 will open with a slant on this one. Polonius will be speaking to a servant, and he will say, I need you to go to Paris, and I want you to spy on my son, Laertes, because I have some fears that he has been doing something other than homework and studies. I want you to go up to people from Denmark and ask about him, and then I want you to put these little slanders on him, like he's been gambling too much, he's been going to the uh, brothels or to the whorehouse a little too much, etc., etc. The servant is a little uncomfortable by this, and he'll ask him, he'll, he'll say, why, why do you want me to do this? And Polonius will say, ostensibly, I can get to the truth by telling a lie. So it's okay. Let's go ahead and say it out loud, because Plato said it this way through Thrasymachus, the ends justify the means. In other words, I get to the truth, so it doesn't matter how I get there, even if it's immoral or unethical. Let's just point out that Shakespeare is developing a character in Polonius that's obviously questionable for us, morally questionable. He will say to his son, to thine own self be true, and it follows as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. And then he turns around and violates his own principle. I should point out that most of the principles he shared with his boy, he himself violates in the very play. You kind of have a sense, though, on stage when you watch this play, that Laertes hears his dad go through these you know, precepts, he calls them. And the son's kind of standing there like, yes, I know, I've heard this a thousand times, you know, that kind of thing. Polonius is the kind of cat who likes to preach, he doesn't like to do, which will take us back to a guy named Chaucer who told us about the parson that he liked so much on his trip to Canterbury, that the parson first of all wrought and afterwards taught. That is to say, he wasn't a hypocrite. Let's just put it in our notes that way. Polonius is the hypocrite, the fool of the play. And for those of you who will begin to really study more closely now your Shakespeare plays, you'll recognize, as I think I've already said to you, Shakespeare loves to get some of, give some of his favorite lines to his children or his fools. And in this play, Polonius will get some of the great lines of the play, even though they're ironic lines. We'll see how this whole fool thing keeps uh, getting played out. Ophelia will come in. In one, in two, one. Ophelia will come and she'll say, oh, dad, you're not going to believe this. Hamlet walked into my bedroom and he is nuts. Now, let's point out, the audience hasn't yet seen Hamlet in his quote unquote crazy mode. We haven't seen Hamlet in his crazy mode. We, last time we saw Hamlet, he was saying, oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. In other words, dang it, this happened at the wrong time for me. That's the last time we saw Hamlet. Ophelia will say about Hamlet, He's clearly lost it. He walked into my bedroom. He walks up to me. He grabs me by my wrists. He looks right in my face for a long time. Doesn't say anything. Then he nods like, mm hmm And then he walks out of the room by still looking at my eyes as if his body knew where the door was. He didn't need his eyes to see out of my bedroom. Now, let's go ahead and pause and make an observation. Shakespeare is brilliant in saying things without saying them, okay? So he creates a certain kind of question and begins to answer it. The question runs something like this. What was the relationship between Hamlet and Ophelia before the play opens? We already know something's going on because older brother Laertes and father Polonius have both said something to Ophelia about stay away from Hamlet. He's a star out of thy org, okay? But what really is their relationship? Well, Shakespeare's gonna tell us something that an audience of his day would know intuitively, and that is this. An upper-class girl who lives in a castle 
will have a very special configuration for her bedroom. She will have an outer chamber where she will meet any visitors. Then through a door will be her inner chamber, her bedroom. You understand this concept as a living room versus a bedroom if you live in a house where you have your own room. And if you lived in a house where there were rules about no guys and girls in the bedroom, but yes, in the living room where they can sit and chat, we're playing the exact same game of Shakespeare's day. Notice Ophelia. It's an interesting Freudian slip. She says, Hamlet came into my bedroom and he was dressed really strange and doing really weird things. It's not that Hamlet came into her bedroom. It's that Hamlet was dressed strange and doing strange things. And oh yeah, he could find his way out of her bedroom without looking where he was going. Which is to say, what kind of a rela- Right, see some of you, the light bulbs start coming. Ah, yeah. Now, this is important because Shakespeare will play this game with us throughout the entire play. Later, when Ophelia goes nuts, she will recite little ditties. It's freaky to watch on stage. She starts singing little songs to herself. Shakespeare wrote the words of the little songs that she's singing. And we're going to deduce through the words of those songs... Oh, there is a relationship between Hamlet and Ophelia that was something more than just a handshake. Ophelia will say to her daddy, he's clearly lost his mind. Polonius will immediately assume that Hamlet's gone love mad. But Hamlet will say something very interesting at roughly line 110 or so. He will say, beshrew my jealousy. I shouldn't have been so jealous as a jealous father. By heaven, it's as proper to our age. These are amazing lines. What's the difference between old farts and young people? It's as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. What an interesting line. He says this, old people have a problem. They're too judgmental. They're too judgmental. They're always kind of harsh in their judgments. Young people have a problem. They have no judgment. They just go and do whatever it is that they want. They lack discretion or judgment. Polonius has suggested this is the difference between young people and old people, somewhere in the middle, the common mean, Aristotle would call it, 2-2. Two, two. We continue with the surreptitious theme. And the king and queen are going to call in RNG. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are flat characters. In fact, it's ironic, the king and queen get their names confused. So, for example, the king will call one of the actors Rosencrantz. A few seconds later, the queen will call the same actor Guildenstern. In other words, they don't even identify them. Are you ready for this? They have no identity. They have no identity. They're flat characters. Their job, simple. Find out what's wrong with Hamlet. Notice the ways, I'll not get into it in detail, but you can go back and read these lines for yourself. Notice the ways that Polonius tries to step around on eggshells to call Hamlet nuts. He doesn't want to call him insane. He doesn't want to call him mad. So he starts talking in different language. The king is the one who actually starts this. Notice he says, Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did want long to see you, the need we have to use you, and that's exactly what happens, R and G get used, did provide our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's, look at the very first adjective that's used, Hamlet's transformation. In other words, he's losing it. Hamlet has lost it. Now, the audience already understands this is on purpose. Hamlet is intentionally faking insanity. By the end of Act 2, we're going to ask if it's still faking or if Hamlet has maybe lost his mind. Okay, we'll debate this. We'll debate this. Uh, a little bit later, um, the queen will say, visit my too much changed son. Mama doesn't want to call her boy nuts, but clearly Hamlet's acting in really crazy ways. Later, the Polonius will be the one who actually calls it lunacy. The Italians invent this word. Luna, of course, is the moon. And the idea is that when the moon is full, then human beings can begin to act in very strange ways. And a lunatic is an individual who has been affected by the gravitational pull of the moon, and the mind has been affected. After a brief interlude, where we're told that this problem with young Fortin bras has been taken care of, uh, then we will return to the primary plot line. The question is, what's going on with Hamlet? Polonius will pull out a letter that Hamlet has written that's really bad poetry. And she'll, he'll begin to read this, and uh, the queen will say, this came from Hamlet? And uh, in other words, let's point out, Mama has been so interested in her new guy that she's not been paying very close attention to her boy. 
We already know this is true, though, because Hamlet has said as much and was offended by the fact that hasty marriage also seems to suggest Hamlet sees that what she's been doing is not only going quickly to her next husband, but also kind of ignoring him. And here she says, wow, he wrote that to Ophelia, which tells you that the relationship between Hamlet and Ophelia has to some degree been on the sly. Mama wasn't completely aware of it. Polonius will say that he's pretty convinced. He will even say, take this, he will point. Take this from this, if I'm wrong. The irony, of course, is that Polonius is almost always wrong in this play. So when he says, I know exactly what's wrong with Hamlet, take this from this if, it's, if I'm wrong, the irony, of course, is that, yeah, you're, you're completely wrong, and the audience is going to kind of laugh at the downfall of Polonius, and we will. We'll see, we'll see the downfall of Polonius. Uh, early on, though, we've got to see Hamlet crazy. So Hamlet comes onto the stage. One of the reasons why you will go away to the city so that you can watch performances of plays, not just this one, but others, is so that you can see little things like how does the character Hamlet interpret what it means to dress crazy. Normally, he'll come on with his shirt undone or off, his pants rolled up to show that he has bare feet, he's not wearing any shoes, and his hair is kind of always usually really messy, messy and, and, and Hamlet will come on with a book. He walks on with a book, and he's reading the book while he comes onto the stage. And he literally almost walks over Polonius, like Polonius is standing there. And Polonius will like, look at him, and now I'm with you at roughly a line, um, uh, you know, starting at like around 170 to 175, depending on your, on, on your folio. Polonius will look him right in the face, and he says, Do you know me, my lord? Like, hello, is there anybody there? Hamlet will look up from his book, look right into the face of Polonius and say, excellent, well, you're a fishmonger. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you. A an audience of Shakespeare's day died laughing. It was that gutter eye, eh, eh, that one. Why? Because a fishmonger was a guy who sold bad fish, but it was really slang for a pimp, a guy who worked the brothel or the whorehouse. In other words, you are a scumbag dog. That's what he says to Polonius. You're a fishmonger. Notice Polonius says back, not I, my lord. Hamlet's next line. These are important lines when we study the play. Oh, right. I, you're right. Calling you a fishmonger is an insult to fishmongers. I wish you were as honest as a fishmonger. You're, you're absolutely right. You're a completely dishonest scumbag. It's all spoken in kind of code language, you know. Polonius says... Um, honest, my lord? Like, what? Huh? We're going to hear this again. This will be recapitulated through this way. Huh? What do you mean honest? Hamlet's, Hamlet will play a little game. To be honest as this world goes is to be one man picked out of 10,000. What does he mean by that? There aren't very many what? There aren't very many honest people in the world. To be honest is just one person among 10,000. Now, what's ironic about this, notice the irony. Shakespeare's playing nasty games with us. Hamlet will say about Polonius, you're a fake. Hamlet has already told his mother, I don't seem to be upset. I am upset. You, on the other hand, clearly seem to be upset. You're a fake. Hamlet tells Polonius, you're a fake. He tells his mom, you're a fake. He will say about the king, he's a fake. Later, he that plays the act, the actor that plays the king shall be welcome. The king is a fake. But wait a minute. What is Hamlet doing? He's faking. He's sneaking, isn't he, right? Okay, he's playing sneaky, right? He's sneaky. So Hamlet's playing the same game, but Hamlet's doing it for a better reason. He's lying to get to the truth, which is exactly what Polonius told his servant he would do to get to the truth about how his boy is behaving. This play will raise all kinds of questions about ethics of, tr of not telling the truth to get to the truth. Hamlet will then pause and he says, um, if the sun breed maggots and a dead dog uh, being a good kissing carry, and I can't go into the, the, the nuances, all of the language that he's speaking here has double and even triple meanings. And then all of a sudden he'll look at him, at Polonius, he says, do you have a daughter? Now what's significant about this is that Polonius assumes what? Hamlet's gone crazy because of Ophelia, right? So Hamlet will look at him and he says, do you have a daughter? Polonius will literally almost like back up. He's like, dude, of course you don't have a daughter. You know? And he'll say, I, I, I have a daughter. Like, Hamlet will say, let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Friend, look to it. Now, Shakespeare's playing nasty word games with us. 
First of all, he's playing the whole notion of the son, S-U-N versus S-O-N. Remember, we already saw this one. He says to, his, to Polonius, you better watch out for your daughter because she could, be, she could get conception. Sometimes it's a blessing, that is to say, with child, but not as your daughter might conceive. Friend, look to it. And it will be at this point that we're going to lodge in the back of our brain this question again. What's the relationship between Hamlet and Ophelia? There is good cause to believe that Ophelia is already pregnant with Hamlet's child when Hamlet speaks these lines. Conception, of course, means with child. Okay? So we're going to hear a little bit later Ophelia herself say one or two lines, and Shakespeare never comes out and tells us definitively. That's part of the genius of the play. But we do know that Hamlet will tell Ophelia in Act 3 to get to a nunnery, and then a little bit later we'll hear that Ophelia has committed suicide. She's drowned herself for questions that we'll have to ask. Why? What's up with Ophelia? And yes, of course, in the history of literature from 1600 on, the name Ophelia will always be used and referenced to a girl who is going to have been in some ways damaged or ruined. Um, Polonius will aside, speak as an aside, he says, <laughs> still harping on my daughter, uh, and yet he said I was a fishmonger, he's far gone, he doesn't even know who I am, he thinks, I'm a, he thinks I own a whorehouse, it's insane. Uh, and then he comes back and he asks Hamlet, what are you reading? Hamlet's response, words, words, words. And let's pause for just a moment. And, and if I could, I'd spend an hour talking about this, but to do it, I'd have to use words. Let's point out something brilliant here. Nothing's happened in this play. If you've been sitting watching this play, you're now going on to about minute 45 to 50, depending on how the editing works. Almost one hour you've been sitting in a theater watching a play where nothing happens other than words, words, words. But if you'll think about it, since you woke up this morning, pretty much all you've done is words, words, words. To what degree is your life really nothing more than language? The words you speak or the words that are spoken to you or around you. The way you hear those words, the way you interpret those words. Shakespeare's playing an interesting game with us. He will point out that this entire play is a play of words. There's a reason why, normally, this play is not taught to younger students because, let's say it out loud, it is a painfully boring play. Shakespeare's telling his audience he's aware of that fact. This play is about words, and if you're not willing to hear the words that are being spoken, you're going to find this play a pretty boring play because right up until, you know, there's like three points in the play that there's any real action, the rest of the time people are just doing this talk, 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 talk. Words, words, words. Notice he'll say, what is the matter, my lord? And then Hamlet will look around like, what matter between, what, what, what? Oh, between who, he asks. Uh, in the book, my lord. In other words, we're playing games of interpretation. Oh, you're asking me about the book. Hamlet will tell him he's been reading, reading a famous satirist, a Roman satirist named Juvenal, who writes about old men and the way old men grow old to start to look physically like a crab and their butt starts to sink and sag and they have bad backs and bad necks and they're always complaining about their health. Obviously, this is another jab towards Ophelia's daddy, right? Uh, Polonius. Uh, and then finally... The, uh, Hamlet, Polonius will say, though this be madness, Hamlet's nuts, yet there's method in it. In other words, something's going on. Now let's point out why Hamlet is, is so much fun to watch. On stage, Hamlet speaks words that are interpreted always as insane when there's other people on stage. But the audience knows that Hamlet isn't crazy. So the audience will interpret the words that Hamlet's speaking from a completely different perspective. When Hamlet calls Polonius a fishmonger, that's funny to the audience because we understand Hamlet ain't crazy. He's insulting his girlfriend's father, right? When he's crazy, he can get away with it because he's nuts. The audience is dying laughing the entire time. Like, yeah, he got him good on that one. Polonius has no idea, but he has a sense. There's method in it. There's something going on. Hamlet will then say, you cannot, sir, take from me anything that I would more willingly part with all except my life, except my life, except my life. Hamlet's still thinking about this whole thing of life and death. He's a pretty morose and screwed up boy. And we already got this sense, didn't we, in the earlier soliloquy. Then Rosencrantz and Guildenstern will come onto the stage. And Hamlet will ask uh, real quickly about, how, how, how is fortune treating you? Now, fortune, of course, in mythology is often pictured as a woman. Um, do you, Hamlet says, are you on fortune's cap? Good luck. Are you on the bottom of fortune's fee? Bad luck. 
Rosencrantz and Guildenstern will say, we kind of reside in her middle parts. It is a low gutter joke. Hamlet's response, you are right. Fortune is a slut. We'll sleep with anyone. You're, uh, ha, ha, and they're all, of course, the groundlings love this kind of thing. But then immediately, Hamlet switches. I told you to play this role, you've got to be a fine actor. Because he goes from being really kind of low, disgusting, you know, that kind of thing, to immediately shifting. And he will begin to become somewhat more philosophic. Notice, Hamlet will ask them, why did you come to prison? Most men try to run away from prison. Why did you come to prison? They're like, what are you talking about? We're not in prison, we're in Denmark. Denmark is a prison, he says. He will then say, uh, Rosengrantz will say, we don't think it's a prison. Dude, you get to like be the son of a king, are you kidding me? You clearly are not in prison. To which Hamlet's response is, well, then it's none to you. Denmark might not be a prison to you, but to me it is. For there is nothing, line 257 or so, famous lines, there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Now, we could spend a lot of time on these lines. The idea here is everything about our life is determined by how we think about everything in our life. That is to say, we decide whether something is good or bad by the way we think about it. Now, that begs a really intriguing question when tragedies happen. Anytime something really bad happens, isn't it true that that event is bad? Or is it rather the case it all depends on how you think about it? Again, this level of philosophic question, we could go into some detail. We won't now. Guildenstern will say, the prison is not Denmark. The prison is ambition. You are ambitious, Hamlet, and you should not be so ambitious. That's why you're sad. In other words, this is a jab that seems to suggest that maybe one of the reasons Hamlet's so sad and upset is he didn't get to be king because his uncle got to be king. Here we think of Telemachus and the whole thing with, uh, with um, Odysseus and Penelope and all of that. Hamlet will then pause and he will say, uh, you know, there's a kind of confession in your face. I can kind of tell from looking at your face that something is up. Why are you here? You were sent for, weren't you? Now, let's point out, as I begin to now make... Uh, Contiguity, relationships. Shakespeare is very much into this question of how do you know who you can trust? He loves this question. He will raise this question over and over again. If you go back to your study of Macbeth, you remember in 1-3, I'm sorry, 1-4. In 1-4 of Macbeth, Duncan will say something quite fascinating. He says, there is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Duncan is speaking about the guy who, tra who is a traitor to him, and he says, There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. There is no way to tell from the way your face looks what your mind is thinking. Later, Lady Macbeth will say to Macbeth, Your face, my lord, is, looks like a place where men can read strange matters. Look like the brutal word picture. She says to her husband, Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Woo. You go out into the garden. Oh, what a beautiful <coughs> flower. You reach down to pick it, and from behind the flower, bam, the cobra gets you and you're dead. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Notice Hamlet here says, I can kind of tell from your face you're guilty. Sometimes we can tell. Sometimes, like Claudius is a good example, we can't tell, right? They're, they're able to hide. Hamlet will be asked by Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, what's up with you? And now in some of the really famous lines of, of this play, Hamlet will say something about humans and the human condition. Look what he says. He says, I have of late, uh, uh, but wherefore I know not, line 310 or so. Lost all my mirth. I'm in depressive state, we would call it today. If we brought in Mr. Staub, he, you know, he would say, this kid's depressed, right? Uh, lost all my mirth, foregone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, this, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. He comes back to say, the world is an unweeded garden. It's a bad place to live. I'm unhappy. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire. Why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. We'll come back there tomorrow, and uh, we'll, and we'll uh, finish with two. Thank you.